there, welcome to the SIP Shelter in Place series on The Stir, where we feature some of Hollywood's most beloved movies, binge on said movies, and dish about what went on behind the scenes, and of course have plenty of fun in the process. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin. And now help me welcome our guest co-host, author, and perhaps one of the world's biggest movie fans, Debbie Baldwin. Hi, Trish. Thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm great. All right. So this is going to be a different kind of fun for today's show. We are actually presenting you with two back-to-back musty movie lists. So we are shining the spotlight on BFFs. We are talking guy and gal buddy movies. And so all fun movies to watch, right, Deb? Definitely. Yeah, I saw the list and I, I'm really excited to be discussing all these films. And for this first part of the show, um, and then we're going to bring you the next one next week, of course, we're going to focus on the gentlemen, the guys. And Deb, take it away. Tell us about the movies on this list. Well, you get, you know, when someone says a buddy movie, um, there are movies that immediately pop into everyone's mind. And too many to list. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you get about knee deep into, you know, making, narrowing it down to 10 or 11 films, which is what we do every week. And you, so I try to put some parameters on the list. And for the guys, one thing I did was try to keep it two guys, just the, the very strict definition of a buddy movie. So a film like The Hangover, or Stand By Me, which are all really great, technically buddy films. About friendships, yeah. An ensemble cast. And so I just set them aside and we can hit up the top 10 ensemble cast films uh, another week. But uh, for the most part, I'm looking at my list and seeing if any of them are more than two. And No, they're all uh, tandems. All two, so. Yeah. Um, that's, it's a harder with the women, obviously, because there are fewer films to choose from. I mean, that's yes. just the nature of the genre. So, um, yeah, but that's the way I did it. And it's, I think it's a good, a good collection of buddy films. Yes, definitely, definitely. And so one thing to note about this movie um, list, um, all of these movies really is the tangible chemistry between and among the actors um, on any particular movie. And um, which as you'll see, for most of them really extended into real life. A few, yeah. maybe not. <laughs> and, and on that note, I did, you know, some of these movies are quite old, but ha you can really, you know, if you wanted to go back, I, I didn't go into like the Martin and Lewis, the Abbott and Costello, the Laurel and Hardy, films just you know there just isn't enough room on the list and but they're all great films and really kind of the the foundation of the buddy film in comedy yes so, but you know with time constraints and also a, like I'm you know trying to choose films that parents who might want to introduce their children to a film that the you know a teenager or a younger kid would plug into so anyway, it's that it is what it is. I hate that expression, but <laughs> <laughs> well, these are some really good standard classic films. And what a way to start the list. I mean, you said we don't go back much, but we do go back back to 1968, and that is the odd couple. I mean, Jack Lemmon and Wal Walter Matthau, legendary friendship between the two. They starred in ten films together. Uh, but The Odd Couple is, um, was a very successful Neil Simon play about two divorced men, one who's a, a slob and one who's very... Cleaner than neat, cleaner than clean Felix, yes. And, yeah, and when, you know, and it's their incredible, like this, this Neil Simon is, you know, singular in his talent for comedy and more, more than that heartwarming comedy. And as these two grow, their friendship grows from living together and they each kind of pick up the other's habits and kind of save each other um, from, uh, you know, a dark time. I, you know, I, the movie, if I'm remembering correctly, is, um, is Felix is trying to kill himself at the in the first scene. Suicidal, yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's 
light, but you know, they're both in a kind of a bad place. And so, um, and it, that movie, and there have been others that mismatch that probably I'm sure predated the odd couple, but I think of the odd couple as sort of that benchmark. Oh, that, most you know, definitely. Cool and Grace and, you know, even Lucy and Ethel to a certain extent and all kinds of characters that you can think of who have this, I love you, but you're, you know, that incompatibility that, um, you know, Steve Martin and John Candy and Planes, Trains and Automobiles. It's just- Correct, correct. Such, such a, it's a great premise for a buddy. Yeah, guy. so you mentioned Neil Simon, who of course wrote the play, um, which played on Broadway, and also wrote the screenplay for this movie. And apparently Walter Matthau pled, uh, pleaded to cast him, for Neil Simon to cast him as Felix, because he thought that Oscar was too close to what he was like in real life, that it would be too easy for him, <laughs> therefore not a challenge, which is some, you know, a lot of these um, actors really want a, a meaty challenge, a meaty role. Um, lucky for us, Mr. Simon said no. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got this great, great film. Yeah, I can't picture that film, that film <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> And so we were talking about the, the complimentary bookend to this, which is Grumpy Old Men. It came out 25 years after uh, The Odd Couple. It's technically not a sequel. It's two different characters, um, John and Max. But it pretty much reimagines what Oscar and Felix's relationship would be like 50 years later. <laughs> And I mean, the movie was incredibly well received. They obviously have aged with their fan base and the movie perfectly tapped into that original, you know, audience later in their lives and, you know, interested in romance and interested in their children and fighting and- Fighting over one woman. <laughs> fighting over a woman and, you know, relevant, interesting, you know, things for these two guys who are frenemies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a delight to see them. You know, I, I believe I first saw The Odd Couple um, first before Grumpy Old Man, and it was just so nice to see. And it, that's what made me want to see Grumpy Old Man, to just yeah. see the contrast in terms of the age, you know, in which they are now. And it was just such such a fun movie to watch and to also see Anne Margaret as the the woman that they're fighting over. <laughs> yeah. Which is hilarious. And we talk about, you know, these movies that have that one bar of music that everybody immediately connects with the film. And the odd couple is one of those that, you know, da dun da 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 Just so, a few notes, you know exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of music, the next movie on the list, there's definitely a song that you can't help but think about um, when you think about this movie. And my gosh, Deb, you know, I, when I was doing the notes for this film, this song had been stuck in my head since seven this morning. Exactly. But um, it seemed like this movie is a little bit out of its element on this list. Um, it's a different genre. It's a Western, considered one of the greatest Westerns of all time. Um, but definitely deserves a spot on this list, and that is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid from 1969. And Robert Redford and Paul Newman, and um, a lot of people don't realize or have forgotten that the song you're talking about is Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, which has also been running through my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible to oh. shake, yes, yes. Um, but... Yeah, and this is like the buddy movie gone Western. It's, you know, a, a loosely based on real events. On uh, real people, yes, yes. Uh, Paul Newman is Butch Cassidy, and Redford is the sharpshooter of the Sundance Kid, and it's their going out in a blaze of glory tale of bank robberies and fleeing the law and... Um, a lot of comedy in this film, which is interesting because uh, the movie got really, I would say, mixed as generous reviews when it came out. It was poorly reviewed. Um, 
and it is surprisingly now number 72 or 73 on the AFI's top 100 films of all time. It's definitely gained so, prestige as time went on. Yes, so uh, the audiences I think uh, eclipsed the critics on this one and the sort of genius of that screenplay which balanced the, the action, that sort of you know historical Old West, um, um, you know, violence and the lightness of the friendship and the comedy. And even in the final scene, it's a bit, you know, there's a little humorous edge to it. So it, 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 it's brilliant in that respect. And, um, but it didn't hit, resonate well with the critics at the time, but I think people got it later on. No, it didn't. But I guess in terms of its iconic significance, you have Newman, you have Redford, right. and I really can't imagine this film without those two, but you know, some big name actors were considered for the roles. I mean, Newman was always going to be there, but Steve McQueen uh, read for the uh, the Sundance Kid, and um, Jack Lemon also turned down the role, saying he didn't really particularly enjoy writing on horses. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, the pairing was just Hollywood dream team. I, uh, I mean, McQueen, while a legend in his own right, you know, instead of like the yin and yang of Redford and Newman, you would have had like the yang and yang of yeah. Newman and it, it, it was, that's, I can't really see that as, as quite the harmonious pair. Right. I don't know how the comedic scenes would have worked out um, yeah. because and Paul Newman kind of wanted to play the straight man, and, you know, against Redford and to comedic effect, of course. But if you, you're right, if you had a, uh, a Newman and the McQueen that might not have worked. <laughs> yeah, and you know, movies like The Sting back that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we were talking about that one bicycle scene. I mean, that's the one that I remember from this movie. It's automatic. As soon as you hear that movie, that's the one I think of, which is a little interesting because, you know, we are talking about a Western and then you're thinking about this little light musical scene. Um, so Paul Newman did all the bike riding in that scene, except for the one last part where he crashes backwards um, into a fence and then falls over. That was actually, I believe, the cinematographer who was riding the bike then. Um, but Redford wanted to do all of his own stunts and did most of them, but Newman was a little concerned because he didn't want to lose a co-star during filming because then some of those stunts were they were jumping off that train, um, you know, so... So yeah, it was just interesting that even then, you know, a lot of these marquee actors really insisted on, on being authentic about it all and, and doing their own stuff. Which I, you know, we think of as kind of a later, you know, sort of a Tom Cruise, you know, kind of a yeah. philosophy, but I guess it's always been there. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are going to jump on to 1980, and I find it particularly interesting that there are two movies from 1980 on the list, and there are other movies that were released in 1980 that of course doesn't fit this list but we had some big movies released that year the first one on our list is the blues brothers uh yeah it's um on my top 10 list of all time favorite <laughs> films. um dan Aykroyd and john belushi it's 106 miles to chicago <laughs> got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes it's dark and we're wearing sunglasses um, <laughs> They, you know, it's the story of Jake and Elwood Blues, and they're trying to raise money to prevent the convent where they went to school as children and were hideously abused by a nun. <laughs> by the sisters, the yeah. <laughs> and they, the way they do it is with their iconic line in the film, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> they drive around and they gather up, and these are iconic musicians in this film. I mean, from the well-known names, Ray Charles, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, to these lesser known guys who are, you know, at the forefront of blues and jazz. Exactly. And to this day, their names like are legendary. And, um, you know, the, and of course my favorite cameo, and, and I'm sure you know this Trish, is the very end of the movie, as they're racing to pay the assessor's bill before the, the, the convent school is foreclosed, the accountant who approves the payment 
is a young man by the name of Steven Spielberg. There you go. So many mo moments in this film. And I mean, we could do an entire show just about the film itself. And then you hear about the behind the scenes stuff that went on. I mean, Belushi would sometimes just wander off set, um, you know, and disappear. And there was one time where he was found in a nearby home, passed out on the couch. Apparently he knocked on the door uh, and the homeowners let him in and he asked for a sandwich and a glass of milk and then fell asleep on the couch. And that's where Eckroyd found him. And that is what led Dan Eckroyd to refer to Belushi sometimes as America's guest, because he did that every so often during filming. And so I just, you know, could picture that and could totally and see it happening. <laughs> and it's charming and it's Belushi and it's also tragic because you know he was probably not sober at the time. Not, yes, but, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, and Belushi pulls out all the stops in this film in particular, um, the scene that comes to mind is when he's begging Carrie Fisher, his fiance, <laughs> for forgiveness for completely abandoning her. I think <laughs> at leaving her at the altar and they're down in the sewer and she's gonna kill him and he gives her his you know little trademark eyebrow face <laughs> that no one could resist. And she falls right back in love with him, and then he leaves her again. <laughs> exactly. And speaking of Carrie Fisher, um, this movie, The Blues Brothers, was released the same day as Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, also, of course, starring Carrie, Carrie Fisher. So 1980 was, was a huge year for her. Good year for Carrie. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. And um, so we also, it's uh, important to note that this is the first film on our list, which actually originated from a Saturday Night Live skit. Yes, I was going to point that out too, that this is yes. the first of many of the SNL people that went on to make great buddy movies. And go on to superstardom on the big screen. Definitely. Um, and so another film from 1980 is a Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor film, just those two, just the image of the two together and that is stare crazy <laughs> you can't really have a buddy movie list without including at least one of their movies and stir crazy is my favorite it is weird i mean <laughs> like when i remember how much i loved it the first time i saw it as a kid and then you go back and you kind of read like the recap and you're like oh that was that was weird it's about i have to see it again you know i really barely remember the particulars, yeah. but I just remember it being laugh out loud funny. <laughs> yeah, and it's about two like regular guys who are best friends who both get kind of fired from their jobs, you know, unfairly and decide to road trip to California and try their luck there and they get a job to pay their way. I think they're in Phoenix or somewhere in the, in the you know, Western U.S. and they... Yeah, they were in Phoenix because they filmed in an Arizona prison, I believe. Okay, and they dress up as, like, woodpeckers or birds. <laughs> as birds. <laughs> I remember the scene that sticks out. And when they take off their costumes to take a break, bank robbers take the costumes and rob a bank, and then these two get arrested and sentenced to this, you know, hideous, perm, you know, 100-year jail term um, frame for the bank robbery. And then in jail, I mean, <laughs> recounting the plot of this, I, I'm just picturing the guy pitching his story to the executives. Thank God he had Wilder and Pryor, you know, attached because <laughs> those two men are two of the funniest comedians ever. And you could pretty much give them a script where they painted a wall and watched it dry and I was going to say, this is um, one of four films they starred in together, so it's really no surprise that many of their scenes together were improvised, because how else would you do it with those two, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a very funny film, and you know, the mystery gets solved at the end, and everything works out, and it's a, just a very funny ride with a, in a very weird <laughs> weird story. So in doing my research for this movie, I was surprised to learn that this was directed by Sidney Poitier. I was Did you know that? Okay, I thought it was just, I thought it was a well-known thing, and I'm like, what? I had, yeah. 
<laughs> like that's got to be a mistake. Right. And this is the first movie directed by an African American director that made more than uh, 100 million dollars at the box office, the American box office. And even with that success, it was only the third highest grossing movie of 1980, because as we said, all these movies came out in right. 1980. So this is the third highest grossing movie behind Nine to Five and The Empire Strikes Back. So we have a 1982 film next, and it is 48 Hours, and Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte. And this is actually Eddie Murphy's theatrical debut. And, you know, I am a product of my you know, era, when I think of a buddy movie, this is the movie that comes to mind. Um, Nick Nolde is this hardened grizzly cop. Eddie Murphy is serving, finishing out a sentence for a robbery and had partnered in the past with this very, very bad, bad guy named Gantz, who interestingly enough, um, the actor who plays him, uh, his name is James, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's either Remar or Ramar. Okay. Um, but if you are a Sex and the City fan, he was the hotel real estate magnet boyfriend of Samantha Richard for oh. uh, more than one season, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, but this was early, obviously early on in, career, in his career and he's right. the bad, you know, very evil robber who Nick Nolte is trying to bring down. So he enlists Eddie Murphy for 48 hours. He gets a furlough from prison to hunt this guy down. And it's again, sort of an odd couple scenario. Right. <laughs> and, um, their friendship blossoms as they, you know, and they're also their sort of moral compass aligns as they, work together to get the bad guy and you know it's just a great movie it is a great movie and there's again you know speaking of the chemistry the chemistry between the two really really palpable and again it's no surprise that much of their scenes together um were improvised just because you know um they were just so good together uh, on film so this is just a little uh trivia thing but the f word is used 48 times in this film and it's just a coincidence to the title 48 hours. We're speaking about two different 48s here, but if you were keeping count or if you were ever curious about that, um, yes, the F word is uttered 48 times. And also, you know, Eddie Murphy's character, Reggie Hammond, apparently Gregory Hines was um, the first choice uh, for that role, but Gregory Hines had a scheduling conflict Another, I mean, even Eddie Murphy will tell you, he was like the fourth or fifth choice for this role. Considered before Eddie Murphy was a young Denzel Washington, which I really don't know how that would have panned out. And imagine how that would have changed the trajectory of those two actors, Eddie and Denzel. Right, and I, again, it's that chemistry, like we're talking about Steve McQueen and Robert, and uh, yeah, it's, I don't see that dynamic as effective. I mean, Eddie Murphy just captures that kind of laid back, live in the moment and, you know, no <laughs> that intensity and that, you know, pushing forward always in his acting style. They're, they're just so compatible. It's, yeah, I can't picture really anyone else in that role. Not at all, not at all. And then speaking of, you know, you said you consider this one of the, the benchmarks of the buddy top movie. Um, I found this interesting that Nick Nolte's character, Jack Cates, was actually considered the inspiration behind Sonny Crockett for Miami Vice. Interesting. Yeah. And then also, you know, there was a sequel in 1990, another 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And to just show you how the dynamics have shifted, the original 48 hours, Nick Nolte was built top over um, Eddie Murphy. And for the sequel, it was Murphy first and then Nick Nolte. So that kind of goes to show, um, you know, really how Eddie Murphy's career had taken off after after 48 hours. Or who, who had the better agent. <laughs> <laughs> that too, <laughs> that too. All right, so speaking of another buddy cop comedy action film, we've got 1987's Lethal Weapon 
Why is this on your list? Dad? And this is the other one, the quintessential buddy cop movie, uh, Mel Gibson, Danny Glover. I mean, you can see this odd couple pattern emerging in all of these buddy movies. Mel Gibson is a hot tempered wild card special forces sniper who is suicidal after the death of his wife. Um, it's a much more serious plot thread for, you know, what's largely considered an action comedy. Right. Um, you know, Gibson's character is sort of tormented and comes across, gets paired with Danny Glover, who has the famous, you know, tagline throughout these films. I'm too old. I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, and so it's Danny Glover is the, the quintessential level-headed family man who takes, you know, Gibson's character as, as a, as his partner and um, to hunt, uh, they're looking for the killer of the daughter of an old army buddy of Danny Glover's and uncover a big uh, drug trafficking ring. And so it's the two of them kind of against this very powerful evil force and they bond over that, you know, defeating that enemy. Sure. And Mel Gibson in, in the process sort of finds a second family. So it's, inc again, the key to these comedies for me is this sort of heartwarming, touching element where, you know, you're connecting with those characters, you're rooting for them. And they set the stage very well with Gibson's character. And um, so, yeah, this is, the, the, and, the, uh, and obviously it spawned 72 sequels, so everyone I else know, <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, this, this pairing really, really, really worked. And you know how in previous shows we talk about how a lot of these actors um, often play roles in which the, the characters are younger and the actors are really way older. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one film where it is the opposite. Um, Mel Gibson's character, uh, Martin Riggs, was supposed to be like uh, 39 in the movie uh, as the script is written, and Mel Gibson was only 30 when the movie was made. Danny Glover's character was about 50. Uh, he, you know, he was like thinking about retirement and stuff. He was actually only 40 when the movie was made. So this is the exact That's opposite from, yeah, from the usual um, casting that we've uh, talked about. Also, um, you know, Bruce Willis is going to come up later on, but uh, Mel Gibson turned down the role of John McCain in Die Hard to make this movie. And likewise, Bruce Willis turned down the role of Martin Riggs to make Die Hard. So these two uh, have crossed paths uh, many times like this with, with movies that are kind of similar. Yeah. In plot. Yeah. And I think that all worked out for everyone. <laughs> Definitely worked out. And also one little other piece of trivia is that Lethal Weapon is the first movie um, credited as the first movie where the modern cell phone makes an appearance. And it was a Radio Shack model circa 1986. So there you have it. <laughs> I know, it's probably one of those bag phones. And now it's such a- Oh, that car. Yeah, now it's so ubiquitous, you don't even think about you know them yeah. showing up anywhere. Um, all right, so here's another one. Same year, another buddy cop comedy action film, and that is Stakeout with um, Richard Dreyfuss and Emilio Estevez. And Stakeout is a movie that a lot of people, I think, have probably forgotten about. It is a fantastic movie for if you have, you know, teenage kids, you know, look, you know, a movie that's edgy but not disturbing. Um, Richard Dreyfuss, again, is the season for Snickety Cop, Emilio Estevez, <laughs> a little more laid back. Um, they each are battling their own kind of personal issues and they have to stake out a house of the girlfriend of a criminal. And the comedy component, and I wouldn't describe this movie, I, th I guess you technically call it an action comedy. Um, yeah. Um, it's a little more um, plot driven in the sense that the crime in my uh, um, recollection it's just the the following of the plot thread where the the bad guy is hidden money in the girlfriend's apartment and Richard Dreyfus all of a sudden 
is falling for this wit this woman this accessory that they are trying to spy on and there's a lot you know hijinks and um and there is a lot of comedy in this movie I don't, it's definitely an action comedy but there's um it's a well thought out story um and you know with good action sequences and uh estevez and dreyfus make a great team i mean there's a big age gap there and i mean you think dreyfus is always older than he is because he has white hair it's sort of like <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, um even their acting styles are a bit different yes yeah, you're right like, and i had forgotten about this movie good. but you know, I do remember seeing it and it was a fun movie to watch. And so we're going to move to 1992. And this is another movie that originated from a Saturday Night Live uh, skit. Oh my gosh, hilarious movie. And that is, of course, Wayne's World with Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. I really struggled because I only wanted to put one, I don't even know what you'd call this subgenre other than like idiot buddy movie or like not really stoner buddy movie, but um, close I, to it. <laughs> a three way tie between Wayne's World, Dumb and Dumber, and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yes. Um, and ultimately, I went with Wayne's World because the buddy aspect of it, I think, is the best um, of those three. And it's um, Mike Myers and Dana Carvey as these idiot high school kids who have their own public access cable television show. In Aurora, Illinois. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a Saturday Night Live skit that recurred on SNL and famously featured Madonna in one episode, Schwing. The movie is a very clever, they did a lot of things right with this film because so many times and they're clicking off in my head, uh, SNL skits that they've tried to bring to the big screen or a concept that originated in SNL and it's just fallen completely flat. Yeah, but more they, often than not, they don't work. You know, very wisely came up with a great plot where Rob Lowe is the, you know, bad guy who is trying to steal the cable show from them and, and, Wayne famously says, and this is a true barometer of whether or not you like this movie, is that Wayne describes the Rob Lowe's character, Benjamin. He says, if Benjamin were an ice cream, the flavor of ice cream he'd be is pralines and dick. <laughs> so it's, and I mean, I seriously, that's how I am. I think that it, it's, but you know, if, if crickets are chirping in your living room right now or in your car, this is not the movie for you because that's sort of the level of humor um, the famous opening scene or right at the beginning with Bohemian Rhapsody playing in the car um, where the guys all just jam out to that song and then is famously parodied um, in the Freddie Mercury biopic that just came out where Mike, Meyer, Mike Myers plays an almost unrecognizable right. yeah. executive. <laughs> And his criticism of Bohemian Rhapsody is that it's too long and that no teenager is going to listen to that in their car. <laughs> so if you're you know, a movie buff, you picked up right, on that. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, you know, I don't know if you remember um, Garth in the car, but he was the only one out of the group in that pacer who did not learn the lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> The, the more building. Mobile. Yes, he yes. Accurately refer to the car as the Murph Mobile. Exactly. So he didn't yeah. learn the lyrics. And so Dana Carvey was actually upset that everyone else knew the words but him. But it worked to great effect because you had Garth kind of mounting the words inaccurately and he's doing his Garth mouth. And it worked so well. But that's, you know, actually what the case was. I'm telling you, that is such an endearing part of that film because everybody's been in that situation where <laughs> the song on the radio and everybody's singing along and you're going, you know, catching up a little late and- Right, and right. To watch, and I actually did notice that about Dana Carvey's character. <clears throat> exactly, but I thought it was all planned because, yeah. you know, and so another thing about this car scene is that, you know, Mike Myers apparently 
throughout filming had butted heads with the director, Penelope Spiris was her yeah. name. And um, this was one of the points of contention where she wanted more head banging. And uh, Mike Myers said, yeah, you know, it's not going to make it funny. No one would find it funny. Um, so they argued about that. And apparently, and this one, you know, I have to watch again, but throughout the, uh, the end of that scene, by the time you get to the end of the scene, um, Myers and Carvey hurt their head from too much head banging, that they're actually being really, really careful with their head banging at the end. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I just thought that was really, really interesting. And um, Freddie Mercury had passed away before this film was released, just months before the film was released. But we're told that he actually saw that scene and found it absolutely hilarious. And of course, gave him his blessing for, um, for that scene. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice yeah. little trivia. Definitely. All right, and so, as I said, you know, the director and Mike Myers butted heads. Um, there was also another um, incident where Myers complained that there was no margarine on his bagel, reportedly, and something happened where he stormed off in a huff and uh, went into his trailer and, you know, uh, and it held up shooting. And so a lot of this was going on. And so the very last scene that they filmed for this movie was the film of, uh, was a scene with Wayne and Gart on the hood of the car while they're just talking. Mm -hmm. So by that time, that scene, uh, they had gotten to that scene, everyone was pretty much wanting for production to be over. They all had enough. And so that scene was completely ad-libbed because nobody cared anymore. <laughs> you couldn't tell, of course. Um, but yeah, that was the very last scene to be shot for that movie. That's kind of a shame. You kind of picture those guys never wanting it to end and like to, you know, keep going and that they were having so much fun, but yeah. you know, it's not always the case on, you know, behind the camera on those. Well, it was bad enough that uh, Myers reportedly um, prevented Penelope Spears from directing the sequel. That's, you know, that's kind of the result of the whole thing. Of course, we had a Wayne's World sequel and she was no longer the director. So that's kind of telling about what, what went down there. And it's also kind of telling about how good she was at directing it because it's, the first one is way better than the second the one. The best one, exactly. And, and she was right about the head banging. Yeah. You know, more head banging. So we are going now to 1995, another SNL related movie. And that is Tommy Boy with Chris Farley and David Spade. Um, Tommy Boy is, a, you know, another one in the long line of these buddy movies chris farley the big you know ha happy happy go lucky easy going son of um, the brian dennehy character uh the head of callahan auto Mr. Park, callahan yeah <laughs> and, um, who has taken a very um a very beautiful, much younger bride, played by Bo Derek, and her son, played again by Rob Lowe. By Rob Lowe, yes. He's showing up in this new kind of, he, re, you know, found another kind of niche for um, acting for him, which is this sort of smarmy bad guy. Yes. Which, you know, is fantastic. He's a versatile actor, and maybe his looks have held him back. Um, but anyway, you know, I've often wondered that, Deb, and we've talked about that at great length. So yes, you're right. <laughs> um, but and so yeah, uh, on the scene comes um, David Spade, who is going to help Chris Farley save the auto parts company, and this friendship that forms between the two of them. Um, as they travel around and try to sell, I think they're selling brake pads, aren't they? Selling it's, auto parts. Some, I think it's a yes. brake. Yeah. But, um, and uh, meanwhile, they're fighting against this, his stepmother and then the evil uh, rival auto parts, Zelensky, who's uh, <laughs> played by Dan Aykroyd, who takes on the role of the villain in this movie. And, um, you know, but these memorable scenes of these comedy duos, um, Chris Farley doing uh, the fat guy in the tiny jacket, trying to make David Spade laugh. The deer is the quintessential scene that everybody 
thinks of uh, when they think of Tommy Boy, which is they hit and they think kill a deer and they put it in the back of the car <laughs> and the deer wakes up and destroys the car. And it's, I mean, I can tell it to you, describe what happens and it will not diminish one bit how hard you laugh actually watching the scene. There's just, it's so funny the way it was shot. Right everything about it, even though you know exactly what's coming, it's, you still can't stop just doubling over laughing. <laughs> so yeah, and so, you know, speaking of chemistry, of course, Farley and Dave, uh, David Spade were friends off screen um, due to their SNL days and, you know, kind of like their friendship with Adam Sandler as well. It's, in fact, Adam Sandler was considered for the role of, um, that eventually went to David, David Spade. But one of the really, really intriguing stories that happened behind the scenes um, involved an actual physical altercation between Spade and Farley. I don't know if you had heard about this, but I just actually saw an interview that Rob Lowe and David Spade did on James Corden's show, um, just talking about, you know, just recalling some of the moments that they had during filming of Tommy Boy. And there was one night where David Spade went out with Rob Lowe for a drink that particular night. Chris Farley stayed back um, because he wasn't feeling well. Uh, he said he had the flu or something, or he was sick from flying because they had to fly to and from locations. So the next morning, apparently Chris Farley got so mad and jealous about Spade going out with Rob Lowe the night before, and so kept hounding his friend you know, how's Rob Lowe? You know, like every so often the next day. And David Spade would just ignore him and go to another room or whatever. And apparently it all culminated in David Spade eating a tuna sandwich outside on the ground, sitting on the ground, eating his tuna sandwich. And then Chris Farley stepping on his hand while he was holding the tuna sandwich. And so that really, really, you know, was the last straw for David Spade. And David Spade threw his diet coke at Farley, which resulted in Chris Farley throwing David Spade down the stairs. And I am saying that verbatim <laughs> to what actually went down. And, you know, even Rob Lowe, who was sitting next to Spade during the interview, said, yeah, I felt like a chick that the two of them were fighting over. You know, um, so yeah, it was very weird. And there were times during production where Spade and Farley would not speak to each other, only communicating through the director. But you know, it, it's one of those things, I guess it just happens when you're in a confined situation like that, even if it's your, you know, good buddy, it, it can yeah. happen. Well, and you know, Farley had a lot of demons, obviously. And you know, it's hard for to be friends with, you know, a guy who's maybe not always clear headed. Yes. So, yes. Who yes. knows? Unfortunately. But, you know, um, they really were fondly, fondly recalling um, how filming went. And that was one of the stories that, that stuck out with me. So, um, another film that was released in 1995, we had mentioned this earlier, and that is Die Hard with a Vengeance. And with, that is with Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson. Um, and now I will say Bruce Willis, to his credit, um, really makes the most of these sort of buddy relationships in these diehard films. And really there's one <clears throat> in every one of them. Um, he's obviously the, the name above the title, as they say, um, but you know, whether it's the cop on the ground in the first one or the airport security guy in the second one or, you know, in this one is the most, the best buddy pairing, which is, um, you know, Bruce Willis's character, John McClane, um, who has been called back into duty at the request of the villain who's just blown up Bonwit Teller on Fifth Avenue in New York and intends to send Bruce Willis on a wild goose chase around New York City. But uh, Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson, wow, what a great pairing. Um, not in the traditional um, stereotypical buddy sense, which is one of the things I really love about it. Uh, yes. There's a 
big racial component. There's a big um, interesting complementary intelligence component going on that's not obvious. Um, there's, you know, and the, 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 a complementary skill set as well. So they're both these very capable, smart, instinctive men. And yet, where one falls short, the other is strong and vice versa. So th this really stands out to me as sort of almost a groundbreaking buddy comedy in the sense that um, it, it moves, it evolves from that very much more typical that you see in the earlier films. One's uptight and by the book and one's right. Like and you're right you're right and that is a good point um you know maybe even bruce willis himself had an inkling because this was actually the only diehard movie and we talked about what there have been seven or nine diehards where um the character or i mean in which the co-star samuel l actually appears in top billing with bruce willis above the title the other diehards, it's Bruce Willis and everyone else. Yeah. This is the one movie where Samuel L. was um, in the same, uh, you know, build in the same capacity. I mean, the, ob uh, the chemistry is obviously there. These two have appeared in five movies together. Um, yeah. This was, of course, the first one. Yeah, and the two M. Night Shyamalan movies, um, Unbreakable Glass. and Glass, which mm -hmm. are both fantastic, too. Uh, not buddy movies. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't call it that. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and you know, and and there's an if you're ever bored and a big Die Hard fan, you can Google Die Hard with a Vengeance alternate ending. Oh no, <laughs> you know, Scott, uh, and you know, uh, this is the I think the original ending to the film, uh, where the Jeremy Irons character escapes at the end of that big final scene and Bruce Willis then spends, you know, uh, hunts him down and it's a, the, for their final confrontation. And it's actually on the director's cut DVD. You can see- So they the, actually shot that shot ending. It. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. So, um, but it's very interesting. And the logic for why they chose what, you know, what they ended up going with is interesting. and. You, I can seriously never see enough of these Die Hard movies. So. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Oh, I mean, you. Die Hard has made an appearance on a lot of our list. Yeah. And um, I also found this interesting in the case of Samuel L. Jackson. He has uh, revealed and has mentioned in the past that Zeus Carver is actually the closest character to his personality than any of the other roles he's played. When you think about the range of roles that Samuel L. has played, yeah. So, you know, that's yeah. that's very telling too and gives a gives a window into what he's really like. Yeah. It makes me like him even more too because that's yeah, yeah. so great. <laughs> All right. So we are at the very last movie on our list. Um, a little bit more recent, 2008, and that is Step Brothers with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley, Brennan and Dale. And um, again, not a typical buddy movie dynamic. Uh, Brennan and Dale are adult <laughs> men in their 40s. In their 40s. Who become Step Brothers when uh, their mother and father marry, and they're both living at home and hate each other <laughs> and are both idiots um, <laughs> and um, are wonderful to watch as they discover that they actually like each other and the foil to that actually bonds them. And we've discussed this too is, um, God, I'm losing my mind. Um, the Derek. Derek is the brother yes. who, is just an a-hole and the you know has achieved every success and his his family's an acapella singing like crazy <laughs> and he's just evil and horrible and you feel so bad for the stepbrothers who were these kind of losers who were acting like they're 17 when they're grown men and the parents get upset and everyone gets upset and then they to decide to really become something <laughs> after oh several attempts at Joe Jobs 
and to create their own company with prestige entertainment prestige they, worldwide prestige worldwide and they shoot a video <laughs> that's a sort of it's called boats and hoes i, I yes. the, and it's taken on sort of a cult status of its own i think that that video has a, as almost as many like youtube hits <laughs> as the film sold tickets yes um and they are going to you know the the, the movie culminates at this Catalina wine mixer where Will Ferrell's character and John C. Riley's character are putting on the event. And um, interestingly enough, the Catalina wine mixer was a fictitious event in the script. It was created for the film. Mm -hmm. And after the film, the event was created in- I was life. gonna say, yeah. <laughs> Is the Catalina wine mixer. Wow, wow. <laughs> it's hard to describe the comedy of these two because they're so out of their minds when they get going on the improv or even if it's scripted. Such a winning combination. It's so out there and funny and only these two could pull up that sort of track. Like they run and they want to bunk their beds. They want to stack their twin beds in their shared bedroom as 45 year old men. And um, because they can do more activities, we can. There'll be room for so many more activities in our bedroom. I mean, the the the, the concept sounded so ridiculous, but then you put these two actors in those roles, and they really pass for two immature forty somethings. Hundred percent. And it's also a movie that you may watch the first time and think, "You've got to be kidding me." And then somehow you stumble upon it again and you're on the floor laughing, thinking, how did I not find this funny? The first I don't know how many times we've seen that movie and you still laugh at the same scenes because they are so, <laughs> yeah, you it's, know. It's why, and it's why I chose it over, say, a Talladega Nights because it just gets funnier. You keep finding little things in the film that are, you missed and that are hilarious. And even the other cast members that- I was gonna say, I think that also helps a lot with just how well um, all the characters gel together. You have yes. Mary Steenburgen who plays Brennan's mom. Yes. Incidentally, she also plays, um, well, she was stepmom to Buddy, Wolf Ferrell's character in Elf. So there's a relationship right. Right, there. Right. Yes, and then this one I just recently found out, Richard Jenkins actually many years ago worked with John C. Riley's dad in Chicago and met John C. Riley when John was just six years old, way back when. And now here they are, you know, working together as father and son. So I think that also has something to do with just the chemistry of this family of four, this instant family of four and how they, they work well together. And you know, it's a, a believable dynamic despite the ridiculousness of it. <laughs> yeah. Virgin with her enabling love and Richard C. Jenkins with his, you know, hard line, tough love. And you know, it's, and then how it, stra it strains their marriage. I mean, it's yes. all, there's a lot of, you know, occurrence of depth to the film that add to, you know, it's how, how great it is to watch because there's just so much there, even though it's on its face, it's this ridiculous comedy. And obviously those two have worked together a lot, John C. Riley and Will Ferrell. Right. Um, Talladega Nights, and then they made kind of a, mediocre Sherlock Holmes movie. Sherlock Holmes, yes, which yeah. I haven't seen because I, I heard about the reviews. Um, unfortunate. But, um, you know, because what you have is two guys who you think, oh, well, they can, put, they can do anything on screen and people will laugh, and that's almost true. But they, right. they, proved, they proved themselves wrong. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. You know, for those of us who love this film, you know, there had been talk of a sequel. Unfortunately, nothing has panned out. But you know, there's there's hope for for a stepbrother sequel. I, I you know, just tread lightly. I you yeah. know, it's very difficult to pull off a, a second successful stab at that theme. You know, so but I can see you know maybe if they've actually grown up and gotten married and you know I don't know if they can that was what I was hearing it was actually them well yeah. established in their careers or yeah. whatever it is yeah. they found worldwide has taken off 
<laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. And so speaking of sequels, our next show will be part two. And this time we are shining the spotlight on girlfriends. We are talking about the ladies, of course. And you know, you didn't think we'd leave them out, did you? So stay tuned next week when we feature um, part two of this must-see movie list. So for our featured sweet treat this week, Debbie, we are combining cherries and chocolate, two classic dessert flavors that, oh my gosh, you can turn into one delectable treat. And I'm talking about cherry chocolate chip blondies. You know what blondies are? I, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so blondies, yes. And blondies. <laughs> Our, our blondies, for those of you who don't know, are brownies without the cocoa powder. So they don't look like, they don't have the chocolate um, color of brownies, and that is why they are called blondies. But we are not forgetting that chocolate. We are adding dark chocolate chips to uh, fresh cherries, which, you know, you plentiful at the stores these days. So um, we will have that recipe for you on gazellemagazine.com. That does sound delicious. I'm not, I'm not like a huge fruit and chocolate person, but the, I would definitely try those. That sounds great. Yes. And, you know, we want to take advantage of all the fresh summer fruit that we can find right now um, because there's just room for chocolate later on when we don't have any more fresh fruit. Well, and Trish, if I bring you some Michigan cherries, will you make the, the blondies for me? <laughs> oh, I will. Yes, it's actually very easy to make, you know, with ingredients you'll find in your pantry in addition to the fresh cherries. So, yeah, of course. So, Debbie, you are the light as always. We will see you next week for part two of our must-see movie list on BFFs. And we will see you then. All right, thanks. For joining us. Thank you.